Hey everyone, welcome back to Med School Moose. This is going to be Emergency Medicine Board Exam High Yield Facts Part 5. Hopefully by now you've had a chance to watch the other videos in the series. If not, I will link part one right here. Uh, let's get into it. Really quick update before we get started. I am super excited to announce that my new website has launched, medschoolmoose.com. This is something that I've been wanting to do and debating for quite a while. Finally had some time away from work to get it done. So that website is up. Check it out. Of course, I will continue to make all of my videos for YouTube, but the website is going to be an ecosystem for a lot of different things. I'm going to be posting study tips and productivity tips, helpful articles, things for medical students, students interested in emergency medicine, residents, emergency medicine residents, all of these different people. There's going to be something for everyone. So please go check it out, medschoolmoose.com, and uh, let me know what you think. That being said, let's get into the high yield facts. First question here, where should central lines be placed in hypothermic patients? Now, if you think about this one, this one should make sense. It's going to be in the femoral veins. The reason being that in hypothermic patients who have critically low core temperature, the myocardium is extremely irritable. So putting any type of central line, any type of device near the heart could, could irritate the myocardium and could cause life-threatening arrhythmias on top of the hypothermia. So if you have a hypothermic patient and you need to place a central line, you want to be thinking about femoral access as the location. Which data point is best for monitoring barotrauma in an intubated patient? This is going to be plateau pressure. Uh, mechanical ventilators are always a bit of a tricky thing for emergency medicine residents and doctors, but the, one of the big things that you need to know to make sure that you're not causing barotrauma in your patients is plateau pressure, and the goal is going to be less than 30 centimeters of water. So no plateau pressure for barotrauma and know that number less than 30 centimeters of H2O. When should external hemorrhoids be excised in the ED? This is not something that we do commonly, nor is it something that we do every time that patients present with this. So when a patient presents with external hemorrhoids, we're going to consider excision if it's presentation within 48 hours of onset and if the patient is having extreme pain. If it's just a milder case or it's been going on for longer than 48 hours, not indicated to excise, but if it's 48 hours and the patient's really uncomfortable, you want to consider doing an excision. Is high volume output more common with an ileostomy or a colostomy? This is just one of those random facts that I want you to know. High volume output is more common with an ileostomy. If you see a question like this on exam, just try to remember ileostomy, high volume output. Rim-like calcifications in the gallbladder wall are concerning for what condition? You want to be thinking about cancer, specifically gallbladder carcinoma. If you see an ultrasound or a CT scan that mentions rim-like calcifications around the gallbladder, you want to be thinking about about gallbladder carcinoma. Moving on, which pathogen is frequently associated with bloody diarrhea and seizures? There are several pathogens associated with bloody diarrhea, but those that are associated with bloody diarrhea and seizures, there's really one main one, and that's going to be Shigella dysenteriae, which was actually on the, uh, the thumbnail, the cover slide for this one, if you had a chance to look at that. But if you're thinking about a pathogen, bloody diarrhea and seizures, think about Shigella. What is Faget sign? This is one of those random eponyms. It's kind of outdated, but I have seen it on some testing material, so I just want to throw it out there. Faget sign is bradycardia in the setting of fever. It's a little bit paradoxical. If a patient presents with a fever, they're a little bit ill. Typically, they have tachycardia, but with this, they have bradycardia with a fever. And this is associated with some different infections. The notable one is typhoid. So Faget sign, bradycardia plus fever, several different infections, notable one being typhoid. What is the most common metabolic derangement found in a drowning victim? This one should be pretty intuitive as well. Hypoperfusion, they're not getting enough oxygen. So drowning victims are going to have a severe lactic acidosis. It may be 10 or above. So that's definitely something that you want to consider in these drowning victims. Get that serum lactate so you can trend it. Aortic dissection may cause ST elevations where on an EKG? This is important for the exam, but also important for real life because an aortic dissection can cause ST elevations in the inferior leads. It it could mimic an inferior STEMI, but use the vignette, the patient's clinical presentation, their chief complaint, your physical exam to differentiate between whether or not those ST elevations in the inferior leads are due to a STEMI or if they're due to aortic dissection. But this is a really important fact to know because it is very testable. What medication has been shown to have a mortality benefit in patients with bleeding esophageal varices? This is one of those great pimping questions for medical students and for junior residents. It's not pantoprazole. It's not octreotide. The only medication shown to have 
mortality benefit in patients with bleeding esophageal varices is ceftriaxone 1 gram IV. Really important to know for the boards and really important for real life. You definitely want to get that on board early if a patient has a bleeding esophageal varices. What is the most common cause of intussusception in children? This one may be a little bit of a trick, but it's going to be a viral illness. The reason being that various viral illnesses can cause inflammation of the pyres patches in the intestine, and that can serve as a lead point to which intussusception would occur. So most common cause of intussusception in children, it's a variety of different viral illnesses. Moving on, patients undergoing a TIPS procedure are at highest risk for what condition in the first year post-procedure? It's going to be hepatic encephalopathy. Patient with a recent TIPS procedure presenting to the emergency department, you want to think about hepatic encephalopathy, maybe check an ammonia level. Just know that that is the highest risk adverse effect from a TIPS procedure. Failure to treat a nasal septal hematoma can lead to blank. This is very high yield. I always see this on testing material. It's just one of those H-E-E-N-T things that you need to know. If you don't treat a nasal septal hematoma, Hematoma, it can cause a saddle deformity of the nose. Next one here, blood pressure greater than 140 over 90 before 20 weeks gestation is considered blank. Remember, timing in pregnancy is the differentiating factor for a lot of different things. So in this case, if a, if a female patient has hypertension and it's occurring before 20 weeks gestation, this is considered chronic hypertension. What differentiates Korsakoff psychosis from Wernicke encephalopathy? This is one of those little nitty gritty things, but the differentiating factor here is Korsakoff psychosis typically involves confabulation and short-term amnesia. So a patient coming into the ED with Korsakoff psychosis may not remember speaking to you five minutes ago, or when you ask them what they were doing earlier, they may make up a story. They may make things up, that confabulation, and that should increase your suspicion that this is Korsakoff psychosis as opposed to Wernicke encephalopathy, where it's more altered mental status, ataxia, those kinds of things. Petechial hemorrhages along the gray white matter junction is suggestive of blank. This is unfortunately suggestive of diffuse axonal injury. So if you see this on a CT scan or there's a radiology report or some mention of petechial hemorrhages uh, along the gray white matter junction, this is uh, due to diffuse axonal injury, pretty severe brain injury. What is the most common blood transfusion reaction? This is going to be a febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction. And the reason this occurs is it's caused by a cytokine release from leukocytes from the white blood cells from the donor blood due to white blood cell breakdown. So the donor blood gets into the host, uh, the white blood cells start to break down, there's a lot of cytokines released and it causes a bit of an inflammatory effect, the febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction. Of course, this adverse effect, the prevalence can be reduced by using leukocyte reduced blood, uh, which is why we commonly use that now when transfusing patients in the emergency department. Next one, an inferolateral MI is caused by occlusion of which coronary artery? This is generally going to be the left circumflex artery. This one is isn't a hard and set rule. A lot of patients may have varying anatomy of their coronary vessels, but for the most part, if a patient has an inferolateral MI, you want to be thinking about an issue with the left circumflex artery. What is the first line antibiotic regimen for treatment of patients with postpartum endometritis? This one is really important to know as well. It's going to be clindamycin and gentamicin. Generally, both of those are administered IV. In some cases, you can do PO, but you know, if a patient is sick enough that they have postpartum endometritis, they're probably being admitted. IV is probably the way to go. Treatment with IV clindamycin and IV gentamicin. Make sure that you have those antibiotics down. What is the most common cause of esophagitis in patients with AIDS? This is going to be candida. There are a lot of other causes, CMV, other fungal causes, but the most common cause of esophagitis in patients with AIDS is candida. Make sure you know that. What is the most sensitive test for detection of placental abruption? This question is huge. I have seen this so many times. This is one that you absolutely need to know. The most sensitive test for detection of placental abruption is late decelerations seen on continuous fetal heart monitoring. If there is concern for placental abruption, absolutely do an ultrasound, absolutely call OB. But the thing that's going to clinch that diagnosis is continuous fetal heart rate monitoring and seeing those late decelerations. Make sure you know this one, guys. Moving on, why is lindane contraindicated in children? The reason is because it's neurotoxic and it can cause seizures. Lindane, not a very common medication anymore. It's used to treat conditions like scabies and lice. It's mostly second line, but we tend to avoid that in children because it's neurotoxic and it can cause seizures. One way that I like to remember this is that lindane makes kids 
insane. So make sure you know that lindane makes kids insane. It is contraindicated in children. A fractional excretion of sodium of less than 1% is suggestive of blank. This is one of those things that emergency medicine doctors don't really care to know too much, but we need to know it for the boards. Fractional excretion of sodium less than 1% is suggestive of pre-renal azotemia. Now, just a real quick background. The fractional excretion of sodium, remember, this is the amount of salt leaving the body through urine compared to the amount filtered and reabsorbed. So if you think about this for a second, a low fractional excretion of sodium means that there's low excretion. One of the reasons that could be happening is due to hypoperfusion. So if you see a low fractional excretion of sodium, it's less than 1%. That is suggestive of pre-renal azotemia. Moving on, eosinophiluria is highly suggestive of blank. This can be seen in multiple different conditions, but the big one that we want to know is acute interstitial nephritis. If you're seeing eosinophils in the urine, you want to be thinking acute interstitial nephritis. It can also be seen in urinary tract infections. It can also be seen in eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, but the big one that's more specific to us in our specialty in emergency medicine, acute interstitial nephritis. Malingering is strongly associated with blank personality disorder. The, the strongest association is with antisocial personality disorder. You can also see this with your histrionic patients, but if you think about malingering, make that connection with a possible antisocial personality disorder. Blank is the leading cause of shellfish-associated serious infections. Not something that we see much in real life, but this is one of those facts that I think a lot of emergency medicine doctors just tend to know. It's Vibrio vulnificus. Leading cause of shellfish-associated serious infections is Vibrio vulnificus. What is the most concerning adverse effect of protamine sulfate? Uh, it's going to be an anaphylactoid reaction. Remember, protamine sulfate is used for anticoagulation reversal of heparin, and one of the more concerning adverse effects of it is an anaphylactoid reaction. Things could get severe enough to the point where it causes cardiovascular collapse and cardiac arrest, but the common one, the one that we need to be on the lookout for primarily, is going to be anaphylactoid reaction because that could be the indicator of impending cardiovascular issues. Red man syndrome is caused by blank. This one's pretty straightforward. It's caused by a vancomycin infusion. This is one of those things, if you've seen it before, it kind of just sticks in your head. The patient becomes com completely red, completely erythematous, but red man syndrome, you want to be thinking vancomycin infusion. And then what is the treatment for schistosomiasis? This is going to be Prosequantil, this is one of those parasitic infections caused by flatworms, not really seen too much in real life, but very high yield and testable for the boards. So schistosomiasis, we're treating that with prosequantil. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you got value out of this video, please leave me a like or a comment. Be sure to subscribe to get all of my latest videos and check out medschoolmoose.com. There's going to be a ton of great content on there. Thank you for watching. Good luck studying.